This is another sold out Dean Speaker Series event. I think we ha all have a good sense for just why it is sold out. I want to thank uh, Michael Lewis very, very much for being here, and I will do that uh, more formally in a moment. And also to Kelly McElhaney, who was absolutely instrumental for allowing this event to happen for all of us uh, tonight. Uh, Kelly is the Margot Alexander uh, adjunct professor here at the Haas School. Our Center for Responsible Business is really, in the most fundamental way, her creation. Uh, responsible business and that set of concepts has always been important for this business school. Uh, she built it into, uh, dare I say, a franchise, a really important signature quality for our business school. So I thank her for that uh, and also, of course, for making, making tonight possible. Uh, this event is also co-sponsored. I mentioned it's part of our Dean Speaker Series. It's also co-sponsored by our Center for Responsible Business and in particular the Peterson Lecture Series. So it's really sponsored by both. Uh, the Peterson Series, uh, that's Rudolf Peterson, a leader at uh, Bank of America. Also the United Nations Development Program, a notable philanthropist. We, uh, we thank the support for that series as well. Uh, the, the, the area of corporate social responsibility uh, and Kelly's work, uh, the work of Joe Magnus and many people here, uh, how do we think about strategic uh, corporate responsibility? How do we think about this not as just a piece of the organization but right at the center of organizations? This is work that Kelly and Joe and many others have been doing around here for a long time. They've been doing it on the applied side with some of the biggest firms in the world and this is part of, of those efforts and representative of those, of those efforts. Let me talk a little bit also about uh, some of the other events that are coming up. So for the Center for Responsible Business, thinking about, for example, our finance industry, uh, hugely important globally, not just obviously in the US. Just how sustainable is it? We've made some fundamental changes. We will be having an event just this Wednesday on the sustainability of the finance industry with lots of practitioners that will be there. I hope you'll be able to make that. That's at 12.30 at the, in the Bank of America Forum. Uh, we also, in the Dean Speaker Series, we we bring in the top level uh, leaders in so many different domains. Uh, John Chambers, CEO of Cisco uh, Systems, will be here. That's on September 28th. Donald Knaus, the CEO of Clorox, will also be here as part of that series on the 20th of October. I hope you'll be at both of those talks. Continue to stay engaged. All of you, please continue to stay engaged as we lean into one another more and more. We will just get stronger and stronger and we'll have exactly the kind of impact that Berkeley Haas needs to have. Without further ado, let me pass the microphone over to Kelly, and she will introduce our very, very special guest, Michael Lewis. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Here, I have um, a pretty difficult task of interviewing somebody who I think is probably, in the Enron speak, the smartest man in the room. So it's a little bit daunting. Um, no offense to my boss, you're the second smartest man. <laughs> um, I don't need to introduce Michael because you, in terms of you can wiki, Wikipedia him or you, you know his myriad books. I had to admit to him tonight that this was not my favorite book. The Blind Side was still my favorite book. Um, but I want to just tell you a few things that, that you may not know about Michael. I met Michael because he was tasked with writing a New York Times story about you. Oh, me. Um, in 2004, and I came here from Michigan, so I, I didn't know a lot at the time. And so I kind of knew who he was, but I didn't know how cynical or, um, I didn't know how dangerous he was. So I just did what I always do, which is love my job and taught a course. And Michael would sit in on my course, and then you were, you were traveling a lot. So th the way we worked it out is you would call me on Wednesday nights or something, and he would say, okay, now tell me what really happened in your course today, and what does this acronym mean, and what does that acronym mean? mean? And then we found out that our kids were in camps together, and we'd, we'd crossed paths. But I think the next time I saw you, and, and I will say one thing you said in the art, you wrote a really interesting article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine in 2004, and you called Berkeley the natural home for woolly-headed business idealism. <laughs> So I just want to know. Um... It was very loving. Yeah. You said McElhaney, who oddly enough is not selfish at all, but open and generous, or at least clever at seeming opening, open and generous, <laughs> while in fact pursuing a strategy of intense self-interest. 
So six years later. You're scarred. Six years later, you're <laughs> scarred. Am I actually generous and open, or am I self-interested? You've reached this higher sort of plateau where you fuse the two, so they're indistinguishable. <laughs> Fair enough. And we will spend the rest of the time trying to disabuse you that this is a place of woolly, armpitted idealism, or whatever you called us. <laughs> but, um, but I live, you know, I, I, you know, I walked over here, so you, you're not going to fool me. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try, right, Rich? Yeah. So why are you here tonight? You asked me. I, don't, I never do this stuff. I know. I never do this stuff. It, but you asked me, and I said... You said no. I still feel a little guilty about the article. I think it's, I, it's, <laughs> you, you, so, 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 so you've got a certain leverage Okay. Over so you asked so me, I've so used I said yes. And I didn't think all these people would be here. I, I have a slightly of... different memory. I, I did ask you to speak at a lunch in April. Your first response before I even got the question out was no. You said I make, and I won't give them the dollar amount, X amount for giving talks. And I give talks for free for charity. And Berkeley is nowhere near either, either end. <laughs> and so I thought, well, I mean, my boss has asked me to see if this could work. I'll try to make a pitch. He said no, so we, we had lunch. And then I said, but Michael, you could speak to the future business leaders so that maybe things could change. Does that appeal to you at all? And you said, hell no, Kelly. That was that, about that's the moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was about the moment I started to feel guilty about the article. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because my memory of it is you said, no, Kelly, that's your job. I don't pretend for a moment that I can change the world. And then we went on talking about personal things, kids and yoga and spin class. And you said, halfway through a completely unrelated thought, you said, OK, I'll do it. So I think you actually do think you can change the world. Not here. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, don't, I, don't, I think that to the extent I can have an effect on things, I'm much more likely to do it when I'm sitting at a computer writing something. But I'm very circumspect about the effect I have. I've seen, I've seen pieces of prose have exactly the opposite effect that I intended. In fact, this book comes about in part because Liar's Poker had had such a perverse effect, I felt I should go back and redo do it over and see if I can get it right the second time. So it's your guilt for having written Liar's Poker that I think was used by Ohio State Yes, students. I don't know. I didn't feel, I don't, guilt is probably too strong a word, but I wondered if I could get it right the second time. Okay. I mean, I, I really did think I was 27 years old, and I walked out of a job on Wall Street that I was doing perfectly well, and it would have made me rich because I had this thing I really liked to do. I really liked to write, and I looked ahead of me on, on Wall Street, looked at people who were older than me, and I couldn't see anybody who was really happy being there. And I couldn't see, at more point, I couldn't see anybody who would, who would once they'd really become established in that world, leave to do something they loved. It just got because it got too expensive to leave. And so, so I bolt out of there, and I write this book that is called Liar's Poker, that is, um, uh, if, I, if I wanted, I didn't really have any particular agenda with it. I really just wanted to kind of, I thought, this is such an extraordinary period in finance. If, some, if, if the worm's eye view is not captured on the page now, it will be forgotten for all time. And 20 years from now, people will look back on this and say, Wal, Wal, how could Wall Street ever have been so insane? I mean, that's what I was thinking at the time. And, and I thought, if, it, if there's anything to come out of this that's any good, um, some kid who's at Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, sitting there or wondering Berkeley. with, or Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> but but my, orienta my orientation was, I'd never been out here. But my orientation was East Coast. Uh, and, th th and they're thinking about, go, do I go do this thing I love, or do I go to Wall Street? We'll say, well, now I know what it's about. It's a little bit silly in a lot of ways. I'll go do the thing I love. And instead, the book comes out. And I, I kid you not, I had a thousand letters, if I had one, from people at, like Ohio State University, saying, dear Mr. Lewis, I've read your how-to manual on how to get ahead on Wall Street. And I, I think I've learned all, everything there is in there. And it's made me even more excited to go and work there. Um, <laughs> are there any tips you held out of the book that you care to share with me now? And it was read as a how-to book. It was that's exactly. And when I went back to work, write the big short, it was the first time I really wandered back onto Wall Street in a serious way. Over and over, I met people who were in the middle of this mess uh, that has been created who said to me, the only reason I came to Wall Street is I read your book. And, 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 you know, I was destined to be an engineer or an X or a Y, but they gave us Liars Poker in business school, and I thought, I got to do that. And, and in some way, I felt responsible for this debacle, because all the people who had lost all this money had gone into Wall Street. That, that, it, was, it sent out this, it was a very funny thing, because, and it does teach you, you become very, you don't become humble in other ways, but you become humble about your ability to influence the world with a piece of writing, in the way you intend to influence it. Um, because... I, 
I told you what I thought I was writing. What I was writing instead when I wrote Liar's Poker was the, there was a subtext that got picked up by everybody who read the book. And the subtext was, all right, here's this doofus who admits he knows nothing when he goes to Wall Street. He stumbles in, and they want to make him rich. Uh, I know nothing. I could go do that, too. So everybody who knew nothing and wanted to get rich <laughs> found my book and then went and did it. And, uh, and so, so the... I mean, um, uh, anyway, I don't know how we got distracted here because we were talking about you. It's, uh, no, no, so this is all about but, you. Uh, but no, no, we can go back to talking about you. <laughs> so uh, guilt, no, but, but... Guilt, but guilt is, a, yeah, I find guilt is a very powerful motivator, but on a more micro level, that when I sit, finally sit down to write, it's usually because I'm so guilty that I have not written. Uh, that I, it's, it's usually a response to some really long period of procrastination. So was this a long period of procrastination for having caused so many people to go to Wall Street as opposed to doing what they love? Uh, well, I thought this was, this was opportunism, this book, because I did think that um, I'd had a ringside seat when Wall Street had really transformed itself in the firm that was really the, mo the, 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 the center of the action, Solomon Brothers. It was a leading bond trading firm, and all of a sudden that became hot. And it was the first big firm to go, to go public. And I thought that an awful lot of the crisis could be, you could, if, you, if you say, what are the root causes of this? I mean, there were a lot. But the, inside the financial industry, um, you, I, you could really trace it back to what I lived through without, without completely understanding it in the 80s, uh, that, that the firms had um, ceased to be partnerships and become corporations, so that the people who were, who were, who were making the bets inside these places no longer had their own money on the line. Or the, people of, or the money of people immediately around them who could supervise them. Instead, they were playing with someone else's money, shareholders' money. Uh, that the, um, inside the big Wall Street firm, there had been this shift away from servicing clients and customers to using clients and customers in the service of one's trading books. And I'd watch that and describe that in some detail. I'd watch the, the beginning of that in a big way. And, the, um, and this morphed into, you know, the best thing to do in a Wall Street firm is not to serve customers, do what financial people have always done, but to be the proprietary trader, to be trading the firm's own capital. Um, the proprietary trading business was invented under my nose at Solomon Brothers. That's who I worked for, with the proprietary traders at Solomon Brothers. And so I, I'd seen that. They, they'd seen the business get so complicated that the CEO couldn't understand it. Uh, and I'd seen a, there's this kind of culture shift that, um, that had happened on Wall Street. And it was, I mean, very crudely put, uh, it used to be the bottom third of the class at Yale who went to work on Wall Street. My father's generation, that's who went. The dopes is, was the, you know, is the, the people who were, not the dopes necessarily, but the people who were the C students and, and, and who were sociable. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's not, it's the, it's the PhD in physics from MIT who's going to work, and that happened. Berkeley. And Berkeley, sorry, and Berkeley. <laughs> right, sorry, again. But again, there weren't many Berkeley people wandering around the Solomon Brothers trading floor, so, yeah, yeah I know, I, and Berkeley. Uh, and, uh, and this transformation was, uh, you know, I watched the very beginning of it, was, was long since completed uh, when I come back to write this book. But I can remember I mean, there was like one, this wonderful moment of transition that I got to witness that reminded me when I, years later, ended up writing a book about the Oakland A's called Moneyball, uh, which is about sort of the intellectualization of sports, uh, among other things. But it's this new sort of person with a new kind of aptitude wandering into a world where he was previously not just unwelcome, but thought to be unneeded. Um, and this had happened on Wall Street in the 80s when with the invention of derivatives, basically, though they didn't call them that, options and futures, uh, there was all of a sudden, a, and, the, and the arrival of computer tech, of cheap computer technology, all of a sudden a role for a quant, a, a, a different sort of role for a quant, a trading role, a risk-taking role for a quant. And, um, you know, for a brief moment, side by side, you had on a trading floor uh, a bond trader who had... Um, the, the guys who had worked in that job the decade before I got there were all high school graduates. They didn't have college degrees from someplace horrible in New Jersey. 
uh, and, and they were all named Vinny and Danny and Bobby, and they had unbelievable amounts of uh, body hair coming out of the tops of their, of their collar, and they kind of walk like this. And their kids are now doing Jersey Shore. Yeah, their kids are now doing right. Their kids are now doing Jersey Shore, right. So it was that, that was who was the bond trader. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, you've got this hairless wonder from the MIT physics department <laughs> planted down next to him, who, who, and they're trading the same things, and they, the bonds all of a sudden have options in them. And Vinny's buying and selling them that day because he likes the way it feels, or he has some social sense of what customers are going to do. And the, and the guy from MIT can value the option with his models. And you could see that Vinny was doomed. That was the beginning of the extinction of an old, an old kind of Wall Street. And I can remember there were these wonderful like flashpoints where you realize that both the uh, the, the hatred, but the suspicion and contempt that the old guard had for the new guard. The new guard thought the old guard was just a little dumb, uh, and that wasn't completely fair. But that was the that was if you ask them and say, "Oh, he's just not that sharp." But if you ask Vinny what he thought about the new guys, he was in some ways very astute. And um, there was this moment that I never got out of my head. Right after I'd started at Solomon Brothers, kind of five months after Christmas break came along, and I was on the big, their big trading floor in New York. And one of, my, one of my fellow trainees who'd gone to the Chicago Business School and was an intellectual of sorts was wandering off the trading floor uh, with his bags in his hands. And there was a guy who was sort of the epitome of the Vinny and Danny types. His name was Donnie Green. When you got to Solomon Brothers, if you had an advanced degree, you were told, never, never go try to talk to Donnie Green. He does not like you. He doesn't think you should be here. Stay away from him. You know, he'll hit you or eat you or something. And, uh, and so... Donnie Green sees this kid walking off the trading floor, and he stands up, and he screams out, hey, he sc kid, get over here. I need to talk to you. And very nervously, this kid goes over to Donnie Green's seat and says, you know, what? And Donnie Green says, where do you think you're going? And the kid says, I'm, I'm, it's Christmas. I'm going on vacation. Donnie Green says, uh, you flying? The kid said, yeah, I'm going to the airport. And Donnie Green reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a $20 bill, and he gave it to the kid, and he said, good. When you get to the airport, he said, go to one of those machines where they sell the crash insurance. Remember, they used to sell those little machines. That was not such a good marketing thing for the airlines. But, the, <laughs> but, he, said, but, but uh, he says, go to one of those machines and, and, and buy, buy some crash insurance and put it in my name. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the kid goes, why? Donnie Green says, I feel lucky. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he did feel lucky. Uh, it was part of his problem. But, he, but the, the, what, that story made the rounds at the firm. And everybody said, oh, it's, you know, it's sort of like the last roar of the dinosaur, the last dinosaur. This is just the anger of, an extinct, of, of, of a, a species that is uh, being extinguished. But the other side of it was Don and Green, I think, at some level, understood how dangerous this guy from the Chicago mm -hmm. Business School was. And, and, uh, in a bad way. In a bad way. I mean, that they were dehumanizing, essentially, a human endeavor. And, um, uh, uh, but, um, but anyway, so I had this, this, this sense that I'd been there. I'd written this book that I thought was about the end of something. It was actually about the beginning of something. It was about the beginning of a decades-long... 30 years. 30 years event in the financial sector. And so I thought, I think this, this feels like the end, of, or you know, the beginning of the end of that. And it does to me. So you, that's my question. That's are why you, I went back into it. Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? About what? Reform, future of Wall Street, future of banking, your children's future? Look, I... Um, we're living in a very strange time in American history, right? All of a sudden, uh, my children are thought to have a less bright future than I did. Um, I, I, the, I'm slow to get pessimistic. Um, and I do think this, our society has unbelievable uh, powers of rejuvenation. Um, it's a very, very, very uh, sort of fertile... Um, uh, it's, a, it, we're, it's full of possibility. So I don't, I, I don't feel, I don't have a generally kind of pessimistic view of the world. Um, you know, every now and then I'm sold on one and I feel dark and glum for about three hours and then I get over it. And, uh, but with Wall Street, I think I'm, I feel like I'm watching a very powerful force go down very slowly. That I, I, I would have thought given what happened in, 
in this latest episode of finance capitalism, that the reform would have taken place, would have been ruthless and, and swift and draconian, toward, and it has not been, but I don't think it's over. Why don't you think it was more draconian, the reform? Because the interests of the people of Wall Street were so entrenched in so many different ways, not just, not just being able to write checks to people who are running for office, uh, but you know, that, that the Secretary of the Treasury and the people around, even around Obama kind of can't imagine a world where the out at the end of their jobs in Washington isn't working, getting paid a Back huge sum of money for working for Goldman Sachs or some such place. And that the, it's, it's disguised, it's a, this is putting it way too strongly, but if I was putting it in a, you know, in a, in a, in a, uh, a caricature of a sentence, I feel like it's a kleptocracy disguised as a meritocracy. That it's a very elegant form of theft that's going on on Wall Street in a lot of ways. It's not, it's not that it's, what happens there is all socially destructive or entirely useful, but it's just, just become wildly overcompensated. And, but it masquerades as the reason you're wildly overcompensated is you're the smartest. And that's because it's no longer the bottom third of the class at Yale that's going to the Wall Street, but the people at the very top. So it looks like they're getting it's just a, it, this is just an affirmation. The pay is an affirmation of all the success they've had before they get there. Um, so there's a, you know, when I was reporting this book, I went and talked to a lot of people in positions of power, and I was just shocked by how at the mercy of important investment bankers they were when they were having the world explained to them that there wasn't an independent source of information to them. And one of the things that shocked me about this book when it came out, it feels for me, by the way, it, just feel, it feels a little bit like ancient history to me. I published this in March, right? right? Uh, and I've, I'm, I'm off probably writing about baseball again, but so I'm doing a lot of other things. I, didn't really, I, don't, I, I couldn't tell you everything that's in there anymore. It's kind of, uh, but the, but the, um, um, well, the shocking thing to me was it hit, I thought the book would do okay. The book's been sold better than any book I've ever written by a factor of two. And part of the reason is, that it got picked up by important people who felt they were getting an explanation they hadn't gotten elsewhere. And I thought, that's shocking. Uh, I mean, I just wandered back into this world for nine months and wrote it. You figured and, it out. And I don't know that much. Uh, and so that, that, that I'm playing that role is depressing. Uh, there should have been a lot better, smarter people than me uh, who were right there tell, to tell them what to do. But you know, I had calls from half the United States Senate. And the, and the White House and the Treasury and, the, and, the, and, and I mean, it was just one after another. People getting in touch saying, uh, tell me more. And, <laughs> and I felt I did have this moment. I turned to Tabitha, my wife, and I said, uh, we're Monty, I'm a Monty Python fan. And I said, I feel like Brian. I, I'm not, you know, that I, I'm, I'm not Jesus. I'm, I'm Brian. Uh, and, and, but somehow I got born in the manger next to Jesus, and everybody thinks I'm Jesus. And I, I, was, I was kind of running away from it for a while uh, because I thought you really should not be mistaking me as the Messiah. Uh, I concur. Yes. <laughs> you know. You know. I do know. What was your most surprising reaction to this book? Any death threats? Any? Uh... No. Well, that's. Um, Apart from, from actual United States state senators thinking I had something to, to tell them, um, to the point where I went through to talk to, first, the House Republicans. The House Republicans, if you can believe it, have a book group. Uh, and, uh, and it... I wrote an article that was the predecessor to the, that led into this for Portfolio Magazine, and they grabbed that. They called me, actually, because of the blindside Moneyball, I think. And they said, we have this book group. Will you come in? We bring authors in. Would you come in and talk to the House Republicans? I thought, they were, I thought it was a they prank They paid call. your standard fee? No fee. So that's, this is not the well, only time. Well, but look, when half the United States Congress is calling you to come talk to them, you kind of have, an, school of you have an obligation, <laughs> okay. right? So, so, I mean, even if you're going to pollute their minds, you have an obligation to go and pollute <laughs> their minds. And, uh, and so, and I also thought, I got to see this. You know, there's really a, there's, <laughs> uh, And um, uh, they, the further shocking thing about it is that, um, they don't, uh, they read the book. They actually read, they actually do the reading. And, um, Did you hear that, students? <laughs> and I gave them a magazine article instead of a book, so it was even easier. Uh, and 
even the, and the most shocking thing of all was how sweet they all are. I mean, you know, you think these, you, you think of, when you think of Republican politicians, you think of people foaming at the mouth these days kind of thing. But they're actually, when you meet them, everybody who's, who ever gets into that position, who's a member of Congress, they were the guy you knew in junior year in high school who ran for class president. They, you know, they wanted to be everybody's popular. friend. Popular. Yeah. yeah, well, not popular exactly. They, they weren't so popular they couldn't afford, they could afford not to become president. Right. They, weren't the, they weren't the star of the football team. They were, but they wanted, they were glad handing. They were, you know, they got along with everybody. Um, that, and so they were that, that, that type. But they were shocked by what I told them. And it, 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 this was my first little taste of, of just how, um, how at a loss our elected officials were. And I thought, when I talked to them, I felt totally sympathetic. I realized, these poor guys, they, 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 they show up here knowing whatever they know about the world. And then all of a sudden, they've got to be expert enough on 50 different very complicated things to cast votes. And this is just one of, you know, one of the 50. And it's, it's, it's taken me six months to make sense of it myself. So, and I worked in the business. So you couldn't, in a way, blame them. And then the Democrats called. And they, they, they didn't call it a book group. They called it something else, but it was basically a book group. And I went and talked to, talk to the Democrats. And when I was Who there... Who was nicer? The Republicans were far better listeners. The Democrats were all in their Blackberries, and they were, they were distracted. They were, it, it, was a, it was an annoying audience. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, and I told them that. I said, you guys are an annoying audience. And they, and they actually put their stuff away. It was, it was, but, but, uh, but they, so did they, half the front row of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, this is just a general rule of public speaking. The less you're paid, the less they listen. Uh, <laughs> It, it, but we, but, we call it but anyway, price value perception. so after I went and saw the Democrats, this is all a way of answering your most surprising reaction. The Democrats were calling me because of the book. I go up to the Senate gallery, and they're, they're actually casting votes on, they're trying to get the cloture on the financial reform bill. And so they were actually, the senators are seldom all there, but they were there. And someone told a senator I was up in the gallery. And before I watched from the gallery for a minute, I was just watching them because it was riveting theater. Um, and it, was the high, it looked like the high school cafeteria. You could see the cool ones. You could see who the cool ones were. And you could see, <laughs> it, it, it was, it was, there were cliques. They were, it was just like high school. And, uh, and they start coming up to the gallery. Six of them came up because they said that everything they knew, they kind of read, got from the book. And, I, and so this is by far the shocking, most shocking response. The second, I mean, in retrospect, which should have been shocking to me, but wasn't, was that no Wall Street firm came back at me. That no, nobody said, oh, he exaggerated how awful the things we, wore, we did were. Or I thought I'd get some fight. Out of, I, I got some fight out of Liar's Poker. I mean, there was a fight for a while, and then they ran away. Uh, because basically, the author always wins when there's a fight. Uh, it's just publicity. Uh, but in this, I thought I'd get at least a call from someone saying, come in, we can explain this to you. You didn't understand it. But just the opposite. From people who were on the inside, the, the sort of message I got was, it's even worse than you know. <laughs> and and that, that if you erred, you erred that way. Uh, and you were too credulous about this person. Or, and, and that, so I, that should have been shocking to me, but, I, but I, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that shocking. But it's a surprising thing, given how caustic the story is. I mean, it's not me being caustic. It's these main characters being caustic. We never say they're caustic about Wall Street. Uh, and nobody was willing to kind of come back at them. Uh, that surprised me. So, but I want to go back to your, I, I learned something about you tonight, that you, um, you were the most gung-ho member of your Solomon training class. Paul Solly's here, he told you yeah. that. Yeah. In fact, I think, um, I think he said that he had read, I wasn't going to out you, but he did, so I'll just go ahead and out you. You had read suspenders with dollar signs. Yes, I did. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but it was kind of a joke. I just thought, because I, I, it was a joke that it was there, in a way. I thought it's unbelievable these people have hired me. Uh, and... and uh, and I, I had this sense about what there was, you know, the new greed, the Reagan greed was in the air. And I went, to, I had to go buy a couple of suits because I didn't have any. I went in and, and like Paul Stewart, they had these suspenders with the gun. And I thought, I'm going to wear those. People think it's funny. And nobody thought it was funny. They thought, <laughs> they didn't, but they didn't think it was, they didn't think it was in bad taste either. They just thought, yeah, that's kind of what you, you were wear. You were cool. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, um. Uh, our training program was full of the most interesting people. I mean, they've all had these. It was, this was the other thing that struck, stru yeah, which surprised me. This is what surprised, not surprised me, but struck me, 
when I wandered back into Wall Street, having been away for so long, was how much less interesting the people had become because the institutions didn't tolerate interesting people. Interesting people, because they'd become so corporate. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody was everybody's wings were clipped. Uh, there were so many colorful characters, which is why I could write liars poker. There were so many colorful characters in Solomon's, and co colorful in a lot of the right ways. They were there was just there was a lot of intellectual energy. It was an exciting place, and I was gung ho in the training program because. It was intellectual, it was stimulating. You sat there for six months in a place that felt like the center of the universe. It felt like the center of the financial universe. When, we, when I went to Solomon Brothers, Solomon Brothers was making so much more money than everybody else on Wall Street that it looked like they were in a different industry. Because they were. Because they discovered bond trading in a time when debts in America were exploding, when the volatility of the, of the instruments were, were moving, when the things were moving around a lot more. They were just in the right place at the right time. And it was filled with all these people who knew all this stuff. And the real live people who were making the money would come in front of you, uh, from, and you could ask them anything. And they didn't care if you were rude or, or well, they cared if you hit them with, 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 uh, with paper wads on the head. But, but, but short of that, you could ask them anything, you could challenge their authority, and you got answers. And it was just an incredible learning experience. It was so compressed. I bet he thinks that too. It was an incredible experience. So I was really, I wasn't so much excited about what I was going to do after the training program, but I thought this is, you know, it was like getting a drink of water from a fire hose. I think it's education. different today, training programs? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I assume that there was such a, there's no way that on, in these corporations that people would say the things as bluntly as they said to you there and then. They were very, there wasn't any phoniness. That nobody, nobody felt watched. That's the thing. It, it, it felt, it, now everybody feels watched. So uh, I can't believe it's as, I can't believe they're really, Solomon Brothers had a weird intellectual side to it at the same time it had Vinny and Donnie. Uh, and the, because bonds were more complicated than stocks. Uh, even when they weren't doing, when, even when they were simple, they were more complicated than stocks. So, uh, math, you know, quantitatively more challenging. And um, uh, they, uh, it's hard to believe that, that, that a, a major Wall Street firm could create that kind of uh, spirit of learning thing in the right in the middle of it, uh, the way that this place did. So, do you think business schools are complicit? And I want you to look right at Dean Lyons and, and tell him. Are we complicit? Are we part of the problem? I can't problem? call his business school woolly, woolly and idealistic. At the same time, I blame him for what happened on Wall Street. Uh, and no, I, I don't, you know, in business school, you, have every, you can't blame business schools as a group anyway for anything. I mean, they're, they're, business, it's, they're, different, they're not all the same. Um, I think the educational system generally is complicit. And I think, let me just think about my own university, Princeton University. Um, it's gone from being a place where people went to get an education, a general education that was woolly and idealistic, uh, to a place that people, that, that, a place that people, have, that students have turned into a very efficient trade school. And there's some great education that happens on the way, and not all the students get sucked into the same thing. But there's now a Department of Financial Engineering on the Princeton campus. You can, you can come as close as you can to majoring in investment banking uh, and just skip the Shakespeare kind of thing. And, um, and the, that was happening when I was going through. All of the economics department was being turned into a tool for the Wall Street uh, personnel departments. And people were using the economics department to signal that they were willing to sacrifice their education to get the job on Wall Street. Not because they were interested in that, they were studying economics not because they were interested in it, but because they knew that was the step. Um, and Princeton uh, doesn't, has not really fought back very hard. They certainly have fought back hard in the beginning about this. There have been some token gestures in response to this move to sort of remind the students what they might get out of this place aside from really rich at uh, Morgan Stanley two years later or five years later. Um, but there's a reason they don't, because the institutions themselves become so much about money. I mean, the, the fundraising ambition of Princeton University is just extraordinary. And so uh, they need to be sweet with the, the people on the receiving end of their graduates. So it's, it's um, the, I do think the institutions are complicit, but it's my, you know, I, 
what could they have done is another question. Uh, the, the financial world organized itself in a very strange way, uh, in a way that, that generated really outrageous uh, um, paychecks for a handful of people. And those have, those have really distorted the behavior of America's youth. Um, and it's a shame. It's, I think it's totally a shame that, that people you know, decide not to be doctors or medical researchers because they can go work at quants on Wall Street. Uh, and this was starting when I was there. I mean, the first brain surgeon to work on the Solomon Brothers Trading Floor came when I was there. Quit brain surgery, became a bond trader. And that's, that, can't be, that can't be good for the society. Can't, people who might st have started actually productive businesses going to work in these places, that can't be good for the society. Uh, so, um, the, 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 um, the question is, could these institutions have fought back? But I don't know if they could have. Couldn't people fight back? Well, they, are, they kind of. Why weren't they? Some people do. Some people don't go, some people don't listen to the, the market signals. Did you fight back by leaving? Yes. And by writing? Absolutely. I, but it was easy for me because I knew I was a fraud there. I, I was, I, I, that, I, spenders or no suspenders. Uh, I knew <laughs> that, that the, I got less and less interested in the job every day from the minute I left the training program. I had this incredible stroke of luck when I started on it. I met this man who ran what was, it didn't, hedge funds didn't really exist in a big way then, but he ran, I was sent to London. And I met this man who ran the single most exciting and biggest hedge fund in the world, and who was con completely contemptuous of the salesman who came to him from Wall Street. And he, so he thought it was funny, a kind of joke on the industry, to adopt me and, may, and refuse to do business with anybody but me. And he refused to speak to the head of Solomon Brothers when he came through London, because he'd only speak to me. <laughs> and, uh, and this man became, in a matter of about three months, the second biggest customer of Solomon Brothers in the world. And so I was generating all this money for the firm without knowing anything. He'd call me up, and he would teach me. He'd say, we're doing this because of this, we're doing this because of this, here's why you're doing it. Tell me what you're seeing there. I'd give him a kind of report, and I never tried to tell him to do anything, because he knew, he, knew, he knew what he was doing. And this created for me a kind of smokescreen for a couple of years where I seemed to be an enormously successful person on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. But I knew that that was a fluke. And I also knew that I really liked to do this other thing. And so it wasn't so much, a, it wasn't a political gesture on my part, it was a personal one. I knew that I was going to become an ever more inept person on the, on the Solomon Brothers trading floor who was ever less likely to make the, be able to make this jump into writing. And I thought, Paul, Paul, Paul Solly from my training program has asked me tonight. I, didn't, I don't think I've seen you since then. It's been a long time anyway. And he asked me if I wrote for the New Republic while I was there because he saved some articles from the New Republic. And I did. What I was under doing. A, on your mother's maiden name. And my mother's, I had to write under a pseudonym. Mm -hmm. But I wrote all these, thi these things about Wall Street under my mother's maiden name uh, because I got in trouble for using my own name once. And, uh, and it, they were being circulated around the firm. And I realized that I could get this, that there was a market for my services doing that. So it wasn't so brave and daring as all that. And also, when you're 26, you're immortal, right? Or 27, whenever it was I, when I left. You mean that ends with men? Uh, yeah, oh yes, it ends. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you just, it, it, so it, was an, it wasn't that hard a move to make. Yeah. You got happy? Did I get happy? Happier? When you well, I was always kind of happy, but I would just, yes, it, was, uh, it prevented me from getting really unhappy, I think. I think I would have been very unhappy if I'd stayed. Uh, I'd have been a crappy investment banker, who, and, which means I'd still been rich, but, 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 I, that, but I wouldn't, I would have been, it would have been, I, it, been, it just was not a, I was heading for a very bad place. So you write a lot about a theme that was interesting, and, and not just in this book, and Michael Orr could be the same in Blindside, but you write a lot about being odd or not fitting in. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a role in education to train people to be comfortable being odd? Hmm. Kind of, it's kind of uh, oxymoronic. Um, but don't you suppose at the end of the day everyone feels odd or like they don't fit in? And then they have two choices. To, to, to amplify their oddity mm -hmm. or to work incredibly hard to try to fit in? Um, I never felt that odd growing up. 
So I decided there must be there must be some people who don't feel. You odd. are incredibly odd. No. <laughs> bike with a notepad. That's, That's true. Odd. That's but odd. I'm normal. Everybody else is odd. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. But I think that I think uh, um, I don't. You can encourage cultures can encourage uh, um, deviant characters. Right. Uh, I grew up in one. I live in one. I grew up in New Orleans. What I loved about New Orleans was just how many crazy people were allowed to roam around the streets without being criticized. Uh, they, 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 that you could, that, uh, the range of behavior that was tolerated was just extraordinary. Is that why you moved to Berkeley? It's why I felt at home when I got here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, the, 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 I, I looked at what was wandering around the streets. I said, I know this. You know, <laughs> it's slightly different because there's a political tincture to it, but it, it's different. New Orleans is just, just it, it's just strange. Uh, but, but, um, but the tolerance of personal eccentricity is something that, that can happen in a culture, and it's very valuable, I think, and interesting. It makes life more interesting. Um, but whether an institution can do it, I don't know. I don't know. Can we do anything? I mean, can I? You can teach people things. What can we teach them? So can I? I don't be to... evil. You, that's what you teach them, right? No, I. Uh, so our dean has, I think, a pretty good four-pronged strategy for the school. It, he, he really says we should make our mark on culture. We're not going to make our mark on leadership because every business school does leadership. We're not going to make our mark on technology because every business school, but we're going to make our mark on culture. So his four attributes of our culture. Is true? Okay. I just, you know, she says stuff. I mean, she says all kinds of stuff. So, <laughs> and if you just pipe up if it's, it's not, if it's I'll not, probably forget it's one, not working for you. I, I would love to hear you talk to our dean about the four culture attributes of Hawes that, that are our core competency. Confidence without attitude. Beyond yourself. Learners, always. And I always forget the fourth. See, that's so Question the status quo. Well, it all sounds great. But? What an but. Why not? It all sounds great. So where was that on Wall Street? Any of that? Beyond yourself. Challenge the status quo. Well, there's this kind of self-selection that goes on in employment on Wall Street. That, that um, it, it's more, but it's more complicated than that. There are plenty of great people who work on Wall Street. There are plenty of people on Wall Street who they get in and they make a lot of money and they give a lot of it away. Uh, so it's not everybody, but it is, it is, well, it is probably generally true that, it, that those, some of those traits, some of those virtues are um, minimized in the financial sector. Some? Some. Uh, well, what, well, what was the one was Confidence question? without attitude, question authority, or challenge the status quo? Well, there's quite a bit of that on Wall Street. It's quite a bit. The hedge fund industry is all is premised on it. I mean, you, you're trying to find everybody. You're trying to, the investment business is finding other people, the, the mistakes the markets are making, right? So I don't think you can generalize Haas good, Wall Street bad. But, but, but I'm happy to accept that Haas is a good place. Do you know place. I'm paying for your dinner after this? Yeah, no, it's, I, it's <laughs> not kidding. a, I don't, I, I, and I, I think, uh, um, Would you tell him he asking can... someone who is a profoundly uninstitutional person mm -hmm. how to fix it, how to create an institution. Or what That's to not do. your job. It's, I, just I, it's not my job. I wouldn't even know how to begin. Um, and you wouldn't want me in the role. The second day, I wouldn't show up. <laughs> so so, so, so uh, I'm the wrong person to ask. So I want to open it up for Q&A. One more question before I do that. What, what, what things keep you awake at night besides Walker? I have a three-year-old who has now decided that, that um, there are monsters in the room. Uh, so, um, so I, don't have any, I don't have a chance for anything else to keep me awake actually lately. That's literally true for quite a long time. Uh, but... Uh, you mean, what am I worried about in the world? What, what just wakes you up in the morning with a nagging feeling? Deadlines always do that. Uh, and um, what I, I have trouble, I always have always had trouble my whole life get it, get, getting to sleep at night because a lot of my best work happens at night. And so I'm in a, in a frenzy when I go to sleep. And what keeps me awake right now is I'm in, I'm in such a target-rich environment as a writer. There are so many things I could be doing that are, all could be so good if I don't screw them up. And that's, sort of how you feel. that's how you want to feel. You want to get to a story where you feel like it's so good, I can only screw this up. And it's hard to find those, but I found several at once, right just now. And that's what, you, what's got me having trouble sleeping, and I have had trouble sleeping lately. 
uh, is this, is I, I'm, I'm kind of stewing on the things that I can't screw up. Uh, but when I think about what makes me, you know, kind of what gets my blood boiling, I try not to let it because it's not very useful for me to sit around, walk around being angry about, say, the financial you, reform. You got in a fight with a handicapped woman this morning. Oh, well, that's a good question. That's a, yeah, I shouted at a handicapped woman this morning. <laughs> uh, this was just a, by way of illustrating that. Things make you angry. Yeah, she was asking me if she was saying, you were saying maybe the things that make me angry. She'd actually behave horribly. Uh, <laughs> uh, but but uh, and she, well, she wasn't actually handicapped. She just had the, the license plate. And she was parking where she shouldn't park. Okay. And then she was yelling at me for parking a bicycle in a slot that wasn't a handicapped slot, but she thought should be. And I didn't actually yell at her. I just said, maybe you ought to look at whether this is a handicapped parking spot. And then I felt a little guilty. I thought, I'm criticizing a handicapped person. That's probably not good. Uh, but I nevertheless rode my bike in front of her for a few minutes, so she had to drive slowly. <laughs> uh, so that, that's how that played out. It was uh, good. I'm going to save two more questions for the very end. We're going to take Q&A from the audience. A couple of rules. You have to come to a microphone. If you aren't in the room right now, if you're out in the B of A forum, you can text a question into the following phone number, 510-730-0272. So if you're not in the room and you want to text a question in, 7300272. And they really will read it. We will. Yeah. Um, come to a mic and really short questions. It's more about what we want to hear from him as less we want to hear from you. No. No, that's Thank all right. <laughs> it's Berkeley. You can't have, this doesn't work in Berkeley. Th th this process is about listening now. Uh, well, uh, so where's your money? Well, my money? Yeah. That's a, this is a very good question uh, because well, let me just first say that one of my problems on Wall Street was I never had any view that I was any good with money. I was just giving people advice what to do with it. And, uh, and I never had any view about what to do with my own. And so as a result, I've always been very cautious. It's just, it's not, let's make money. It's just, no, don't lose it. So it ends up being in a really boring, in the best of times, a really boring, diversified portfolio of indices, basically, is what it is. Stock market indices and few bonds, and that's kind of it. In this, but I got so spooked working on the big short, so completely spooked. In fact, at one point, I, almost, I was almost persuaded by a hedge fund manager. I, I was, after he laid the rap on me about what he thought was going to happen as a result of this debacle, where we, we were all of a sudden going to be, it was, we were going to be in Mad Max, basically. It was going to be <laughs> crazy Australians guns. gunning us down in yeah. the desert when we were going out for water. He, he, that so I say, and, and he lays out this whole scenario. It's totally persuasive. And I said, oh, my, I said, this is horrible. That's just horrible. What, <laughs> what do you tell your mother when she calls you and asks for, like, financial advice? I, he, he says, I tell her, Mom, guns and gold. Get some gig. <laughs> <laughs> Arm yourself. You do know you're in Berkeley. <laughs> yes. Arm yourself and get, and, he sa and then he proceeded to say, and I don't mean gold futures, because that, that futures market is not going to exist, bars. And he started, <laughs> he pulled out p platinum and gold bars from this thing he, that he was, that was where he was keeping his money. And I, and I can't go there. I kind of figure if that happens, you can't eat the gold. Uh, um, so what I, it's, what I have done instead, I've done what the rest of the world's done that I take even less risk than I took before, even though I took very little. So instead of having 50% of what I have in stocks, I have 20% or 15%. And I just, just try not to lose it. But of course, this could be a strategy for losing it all. <laughs> if our government debases the dollars that I'm, that I'm holding, then, then I'm in trouble. But I don't have any, any great answer. I always tell people who ask me that question, what should I do with my money? The first answer is always, if you're listening to me, you probably got a problem already. But, <laughs> but the, the second answer is, is, this isn't answerable. There are all these people out there who can pre pretend to be able to tell you to, what you can do with your money. And they almost, they, if you listen to them, you get in trouble. It's so hard to find, to, the, this, it's a great question whether this is even an identifiable skill, who, the ability to predict where markets are gonna go or where stock prices are gonna go. And in my career as an investor, such as it is, there have been a few times where really almost as a matter of um, politeness, I've listened to a broker. That I had an old family friend who was a, a guy at Merrill Lynch who, who was an adv a financial advisor. I kept our money at Merrill Lynch because his dad was friends with my dad and his granddad had been friends with my granddad. And he calls me up in 
He's been peppering me with ideas for eight years. I kind of feel badly because he thinks I'm a, like a big time financial writer and I'm not listening to his ideas. And he sort of, so I think I'm going to just do a couple of things he says just so he feels okay. And uh, this is 2007. And I, and I say, all I want is just not to lose it. I don't care what happens. This as long as it does, doesn't lose it. And the two things he sells me are Lehman Brothers Preferred <laughs> and auction rate securities. And um, that's pretty great. Two, he's two for two. Uh, but, but, and this was someone who was regarded in his Merrill Lynch office as a great wizard with this stuff. And then I actually, at that, after that episode, I pulled all of our money out of Merrill Lynch and put it in Charles Schwab because I didn't have to defend myself against Charles Schwab because they didn't try to tell me what to do. They didn't, they, they weren't, they didn't make money off the churn. So uh, it was a, um, you got to be so careful. When you, it's in a weird way, the more willing someone is to answer your question, the less likely you should be to take their advice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you titillated us. What are the, uh, <clears throat> the various projects you're percolating around now for the future? Ah, all right. I, mean, I can't tell you too much about them because I don't want to. I don't want to lose my little monopolies. I can. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But so um, for the last six or seven years, I've had interest in, in from the TV industry. And I think TV is in a golden age, not the reality program TV stuff, but the scripted dramas on TV. There's unbelievable work being done. And you can get, you can, you can put a novel on a screen. And the television writing is so superior to movie writing now because the writer has control in the television business. And he has control because they need a next episode. And the writer's a creator, and the director is the guy who just points the camera. Sometimes the writer picks up the camera and he points it too. But the, the role of the writer is at the center of the thing. So it's intriguing me to be able to get my hands on a TV show. And I've written three scripts that didn't get made uh, for, for networks. And I never watched network television. And about a year and a half ago, I had some interest from HBO, which I watch obsessively, to write a, uh, a, t a, sh a drama. And I got distracted by the big short, so I, I've only just gotten around to it, but I've just finished, I've just handed in basically the script to him. Uh, and it's, uh, I wrote a magazine piece for Vanity Fair, for whom I write occasionally, a year and a half ago about Cuba, two years ago now, about Cuba. It was about a, a true story, American baseball agent, pretty well known American baseball agent, who, has been, who was sentenced to, and served five years in jail for helping Cubans get out of Cuba so they could play baseball here. And we have these weird laws with Cuba, but you can, if a Cuban lands on the beach, you can help him. He's a city, he has a right to citizenship. If he's in the water and you pull him to the beach, you can go to jail. And uh, it's the wet foot, dry foot policy. Anyway, he was accused of helping Cubans in the water and he got put in jail. And I thought, <clears throat> in the piece, but even more so in the TV show, that this nexus, this sports agent, uh, who's in the middle of this market for Latino ballplayers and Cubans, too, is, um, uh, is a wonderful way to get into immigration as a subject. You can, you can fool the audience into watching a TV show that's really about immigration because they think it's about sports and money and, uh, um, and human smuggling. Uh, so that's what I, what I hope happens is that I get a call from HBO saying, we're doing it, get down here. And so that's what I would, and I would create the show create a TV show. If that doesn't work, and it probably won't, the odds are always against a TV show. Um, I've got this, when I sold my baseball book, Moneyball, um, I sold it as two books. And I sold it, um, the, how many people have read Moneyball? Just so we don't want to, all right, I, mean, I, won't, I won't reprise it then. But anyway, the, I never written it about sports at all. And I, got, I went and I spent a couple of months with the Oakland A's, and there's this incredible story. This, 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 this team that has no money that's rethinking how you value baseball players and baseball strategies in response to its, its, its poverty. And actually generating new baseball knowledge. Who would have thought such a thing existed? Um, the moment it dawned on me just how, that it was a story I couldn't screw up, that it was that, that good a story, was when they were drafting players in the 2002 amateur draft. And they were drafting players using an algorithm rather than listening to their expert scouts. Uh, they, they, were, they, they were trying to turn it into a science. And the, so they drafted this pool of players. Not all the players in that draft, but most of them were drafted with an algorithm. 
And I thought, I want to write a story about what happens to these lab rats who are on the other end of this algorithm. So I followed those players for the first few years. I did a lot of reporting in the minor leagues. And there's one, and I, but I needed to wait until we saw what happened to them. And now we know. Now they're all 30. And now you, and nothing much good happens to a baseball player after he's 30 years old. So, um, but in any case, I wrote my publisher. I said, I'm going to write not just a magazine piece, but a book about baseball. Not one book, but two books. And I got to write this first one, which is going to be called Moneyball, because I really want to write the second one, which is going to be called Underdogs. And so that's the, that's the next book. The third strand here, I'm glad because my wife won't listen to this. I, mean, it's, it, <laughs> uh, I appreciate you asking the question, because she really won't listen to this. And I get every chance to talk. And people always cut me off when I'm trying to explain to them what's on my mind. So I can just get this out here. And, uh, Do you guys want to go ahead and leave? Yeah, you can leave if you want. <laughs> But if this is just, I'll shut up after this, even this isn't quite it. This is the third of four. The third is, so this, this financial debacle um, that we are living through, um, it hit, the, the, the raw financial event was very similar across the world, especially in Europe and America, that, that cheap credit washed around the globe. People, financial people made money lending, lending money to people who would never pay it back. And so lots of people who were never going to pay it back got loans. And, um, but the, the specific event was different from culture to culture. So Iceland was very different from England, which was very different from Greece. And I've written two big magazine pieces already, one about Iceland, one about Greece, that came out this week in Vanity Fair, where they, they dropped me in. I, it's, I describe it, it's financial disaster tourism. I get financial disaster tourism. I get dropped in to be a tourist and write about the financial disaster in these places that are decimated by this event and write about what it shows you about this culture, the way it responded to free money. Um, and uh, I've got three more I want to do. Ireland? Uh, one of the Baltic republics. And um, California, leading to the U.S. Treasury. It's, more, it's less interesting doing California because I know it. I'm not coming in as an alien from out of space. But I could try. And, uh, and so I think, so those, and I kind of want to do Germany too because they're on, they're on the receiving end of it all. They bought everybody's crap. They did, every bad investment there was to make, the Germans made it. You can't name one. They didn't make. They bought the condos in Spain. They bought, they've bankrupted, they bankrolled the Icelandic tycoons. They bought Greek government bonds and they bought a raft of subprime mortgage-backed bonds. And the Germans yet have emerged from this relatively more powerful than anybody. And in a weird way, um, are having their identity reshaped by this event. All of a sudden, they're self-righteous. All of a sudden, they're in, they're, because they've been stiffed by all these people. And it's been, in my lifetime, I can't remember when it was okay for Germans to be self-righteous and, mor and, and morally indignant. And, nobody, and, uh, and so, that's, so there's a change that's going on in the world because of what's happening in money. And I think you can kind of get at it in, a, in my superficial way, dropping into these cultures for a couple of weeks each and writing these stories. So I want to do those. And I just can't figure out how I'm going to do them all. That's my problem. Nice. Here. Uh, since you raised Moneyball, a, th a theme that I see throughout your books is that you write about a handful of people who see things that a lot of people at large who should get paid, who get paid theoretically to see these things, they don't. And in Moneyball is Billy Bean. In uh, The Big Short is about a guy with Asperger's who's blind in one eye, who basically robs the market blind because they're mispricing risk. Right. My question to you now is, who in society do you think is seeing something we're not seeing, and what do you think it is that they are seeing that we don't see? That's a, big, that's a very broad question. We um, have to charge you for that information. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't even know where to begin with that. I, it's, it's, uh, I mean, if you're talking about people who are getting a commercial, who have a commercial angle to it, who are going to profit from what they're seeing, I have no idea. Um, people who uh, uh, have some perspective that's interesting to me. Um, Obama, actually, is someone I'm very interested in. If o Obama is a wonderful story right now. I think he's a very, very, very wise and shrewd and interesting man who's been put in this really horrible position and is learning about the world. But has a, it has a, he has a... If you, get, if you could sit him down and ask him about how this country works, you'd learn a lot. Um, uh, the... Um, 
uh, you know, they're, 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 they are individuals that, I, that are on my radar screen who I might write stories about. It's a guy in basketball, the GM of the Houston Rockets, who's got a very curious view of basketball, of how to evaluate basketball players. That's a little example, but I, I don't, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know, I don't know how to answer the question. Can I ask a, a completely innocent follow-on mm -hmm. question? Completely innocently. Any women on your radar screen? Um, let me think. No, I mean, because it's a good question. I mean, the, the main character, one of the main characters of the HBO thing is a woman. And uh, if the HBO thing doesn't work out, I have this script that's in, it, it turn around, but has a buyer. Uh, it's all women. It's a, it's a Wall Street show, and the main characters are all women. They're women who didn't, who were one way or another, uh, maltreated by the big firms, and they set up their own, their own um, hedge fund. And the whole story is how women see this world differently than men. Uh, so that they, they've been, they were on my mind a lot recently, but um, we put it in turnaround. But I think this could come out. So I think that. But so they're in my life. Um, but those are fictional. Um, female characters. Uh, you know. No, but they're not a lot of men either. I mean, I don't think, you know, with the stories I'm writing, uh, there are no women in baseball. There's one. You know, there are two. There's nobody, I mean, there's nobody who would naturally be a character there except the wives of the players are in, the, in that story. Um, and uh, the, financial, the, the, the financial disaster tourism that I've been flirting with, um, seldom do you find a woman in the middle of this mess. So is it possible that's part of the... Is problem. Yeah. Look at the Iceland. Did you read the piece I wrote about Iceland? That was the theme. The theme was the problem was men uh, and male overconfidence and the women. And if you look at what's happened in Iceland since the piece came out, uh, but it was happening anyway, the women have, take, have taken over. Uh, they, they elected a female prime minister. Right. They, they basically, they, they, at least two of the three big banks have booted men out of the CEO job and put women in. And it's, it's 300,000 people. It's a, it's, a, it's a village. And basically, I think what happened is the women said, we listened to you because we thought you knew what you were doing because you thought you knew. You didn't know what you were doing, so you're out of here. And the women, <laughs> and so that, that story was all about that gender, the gender issue. But I, and I've always thought that Wall Street would be much less insane if, to the extent it let women in. But the problem is, and it has let women in, a lot more than when I was there. The problem is let them in as honorary men. That it's sort of like you're in, but you have to play by our rules. And so women aren't in as women. Uh, they're in, they're in as, as long as they masquerade as men at the very senior levels. So, but I think that I think that could very easily change. I don't think that's there's no reason that's got to be that way. And I think when it does, uh, we'll all be a little safer. I think it'll be an interesting. Um topic for you to think about, and I think that Tabitha would listen to you. But look, you can't really accuse me, sitting and accuse me of not focusing on women. I wrote about you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I saw mean, another I'm sorry. question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you did not. I saw another question, and then we've got one text question, and then I get the last question, and you know it's going to be a hardball after this. Hi there. So given the audience that you have now, given your ability to empathize with Brian and Monty Python, and also your calling to go talk to the Republicans and Democrats. I'm curious, with the rest of your career, if there's a specific uh, impact that you want to leave on society and all of us. You know, it's, this is a very strange question. I think that it, it, it's a strange issue for a writer. Because some part of me really believes that the minute the writer starts thinking that way, he's done. He starts thinking of himself as this important world changer, and he's going to write, you know, it's, it, that he's going to write the instruction manual for humanity. He, see, his, he, ceases, he begins to suck at his job. And uh, that he becomes pompous. He becomes, he becomes a, a ridiculous person, so, just overly self-important. And um, the, the, um, but you can't deny that there's some effect that the written word has. You, can't just, you just can't really predict what, the effect your written word will have. I think that to the extent, um, the extent 
I can have an effect. I like the idea. This is what I like the idea of. I like the idea of, of being a, um, a carrier of the virus of irony. Uh, I like the idea of, giving, uh, of introducing irony into Wall Street uh, or, or into situations that are previously humorous, uh, humorless. Um, I like giving people an attitude towards problems and an attitude towards the world rather than giving the idea that I'm going like, to tell them how to be, how to be, how to behave, how to, what, what decisions to make. Uh, so I don't, that's the extent of it with me, really. And for my career, such as it is, it's really, it's a very um, uh, up close, uh, it's not terribly respectable thing. I mean, it's, it's not a well-built house. My career is jumping from rock to rock to get across the stream and just trying to find the next rock. That I don't have a, I don't have a, a theory about what I should be doing with my time, except I should be really passionately engaged with it. I, really, I should really care about what I'm writing about and it feel important to me. But beyond that, nothing. And, uh, and so given that, it's a little hard for me to have a global strategy for how I'm going to affect the world because I don't even know what I'm going to be writing about. Uh, the, um, the thing I, I fear with what I do, and you see it, you see it with you see it with writers who've had been lucky who've been lucky enough to find audiences, is that there's enormous pressure on you to just repeat yourself, to do the same book over and over. In That's some, the faculty job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is. It, it, but even fail writers will write the same book over and over. But successful ones have enormous pressure to do kind of the same sort of thing, and the pressure just gets as you get older and it gets harder to do new things because it does. It's it, you know it gets harder to try new foods and harder to listen to new kinds of music and wear new kinds of clothes. There are very there are, there are elaborate studies of this <laughs> that that the human taste for novelty shrinks dramatically, starting about the starting at the age of twenty five. And then, and really kicking in about age 35. Then when you, I'm 49, I know that I am resistant to things that when I was 25 I wouldn't be resistant to. I try to keep myself open, so that because you never know what's gonna gonna come. But uh, my fear is that that I'm gonna ossify, and that, that I'm gonna that I'm gonna that I'm gonna become more interested in just being successful in the eyes of others than getting the kind of gratification I get out of what I do when I'm doing it. And they really are two different things. So we have a text question, which I think is actually Mo's question. I don't think it came through text. I think he um, put it in there. But I'm going to try to match it with my question to the end, because we're in an educational institution, so you know I have to ask you. Some people in this room are graduating with their MBA mm -hmm. soon. Your advice to them is what? And let me just meld together two questions. The text question is you sort of thinking that a lot of the crisis was a result of the misalignment of incentives. Mm -hmm. I've heard you talk about a few themes tonight about what should be individuals' incentives moving forward through life. So the life, according to Michael Lewis, is do the thing that you love. Very important. Be passionately energized. Really care about what you do and stay open. They're all vague, and you can put them on pillows and put the pillows on your sofa. Uh, they're, they're a bit like your mission statement. You know, they're, they're, in that, in that they're, they're totally unobjectionable. Who's going to object to any of that? Except they came from your Who's mouth, gonna, Mr. I mean, Lewis. Hitler probably was passionate about what he was doing. It's, it's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a, these are unobjectionable. It's true, though. Right. So uh, is that what the incentives in the world are going to be when these guys get out? I mean, what, what should they do with their lives? Is no, that... what are they going to find are going to be the incentives when they get out into the world? Is it going to, are they going to be incented to do, to do the thing they love? Are they going to be incented no, 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 no. to be not. passionately engaged? No, almost, uh, you know, they're very lucky if they're incented to do things they love because you, typically the things you love to do, other people love to do too, and, and it, people will do it for less than you will do it kind of thing. In the same way that... It, the analogy of this in the investment world is never invest in the movie business because too many people will do it for non-economic reasons. <laughs> uh, but the, the, so it all, that I, I'm, uh, one, uh, I'll give a piece of advice. That's what you want me to do. I do. End with advice. All right. Not to me, to them. So you get all these short-term financial signals. I had yeah. them. 
Uh, I got paid $260,000 when I was 24 years old at Solomon Brothers and told that if I hung around another year, I'd get a half a million, and after that, it was just millions. And all I had to do was basically keep the seat. And, uh, and, but the, and so there's, there's a, that's, that's information that's telling you something. And you can, you can be ruled by that information, or you can just take it and leave it. And sometimes it's worth taking and leaving it. I'm amazed in our culture how often people, even very rich people, only do what it pays them to do. So every season, after every season, there's some baseball player who goes from making $5 million, leaving a team that loves him and that he loves in a community where his children are in school and his wife loves, and he uproots them all for $8 million a year. And the, the, this, this mindless response to the most money is crazy. It's not, a, it's not a recipe for a happy life. We have much research that shows that over a certain pretty low level of income, money doesn't buy happiness. Um, and so to, to let money make your decision for you is appalling. It's just a mistake. It's like a mental error. It's a status mistake because People who make money, are able, they're able to present to other people a, a different status than people who don't make money. But, um, but if, when you get to that juncture, I mean, some people have a problem. They, they never find anything they love to do. So in which case, just go make money. I mean, right? But, but, but there will be plenty of your students. I assume if they're here, they were attracted by the woolly idealism. So, they, so that's a, there's this kind of passion underneath that. So they probably do all have passions. And they're all smart. And, and there will be some moment in their lives when the money says do this and their heart says do that. And unless it's just horribly irresponsible to your loved ones or, or, and your children might starve and all the rest, you, you got to do that. You don't do this. Uh, so that's what I'd say. It's pretty woolly-haired and idealistic yeah. of you. It's yes. impressive. Um, I want to actually sincerely thank Michael for not charging his standard speaking rate <laughs> tonight <laughs> um, and for being here as a friend of mine and as a friend of Haas, and we will now ask you for money on the way out. Yes. <laughs> but no, I want to thank everybody for coming and um, thank Dean Lyons for what I think is a, a phenomenal, uh, even though you don't, the four-pronged strategy for the, for the <laughs> I know, it's, just unob <laughs> it's unobjectionable. I do point. still think we can actually change the future of business leadership and thank you all here and think what you each can do when you walk out of here to be a little bit woolly-haired and a little bit idealistic in a way that makes the world a better place. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.